Hallelujah. All right. So look, we're going to be in. Uh, so so today we're going to we're getting close to finishing up the prayer, um, the prayer series. I titled this message. Pray for this bread. We already preached a message of our father. And then we preached hallowed be thy name. And then we preached your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Part one, the individual. Part two, God's kingdom. Amen. And viewing it from his angle. And now this one is give us this day, our daily bread. Amen. And I titled it pray for this bread. And as I was looking, considering the bread of God, or as I was considering the message about God's bread, I, two, well, really three passages. I, I, one of them didn't make the cut. It was about Ezekiel when he was, not Ezekiel, Elijah, when he was fed by the ravens, by the brook Cherith. And so the two that I felt like the Lord really wanted me to focus in on comes out of one Exodus 16, where it described the fact that God gave bread from heaven. And then number two, John chapter six, where Jesus explains that he is the actual bread that God gave from heaven. Amen. And so if I was going to give it an emphasis, uh, I would say that, that the emphasis of this message is praying for, believing in, and receiving God's life every day his way. Yes. Praying for, believing in, and receiving God's life every day his way. And so the point that I want to make first off is this. God's baking bread. I want you to know that God is baking bread. And the question that really we're going to see in this next passage of scripture is this. Will we follow the recipe? You know, some people don't like to cook by recipe, but I got to tell you, I don't know much about baking, but I've heard you really have to follow the recipe whenever you're baking. Amen. And the Lord gave some explicit instructions in Exodus chapter 16. And, and, and if we'll go to Exodus chapter 16 and we'll start with verse four, by the way, hopefully I think I'm sure Jace did a good job in handing out communion to everyone outside. Amen. And we will be taking communion today after my message. Aaron will come up and lead us in uh, taking communion. If he's still here, praise God. And if not, I'll do it. Amen. So Exodus chapter 16, verse four, it says, and then the Lord said to Moses, behold, I am about to rain bread. Oh, this I'm using the ESV version, by the, by the way. Sorry. Yeah, there we go. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day. Now, I want you to see this part right here, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. Now let's look, let's skip down to verse 20 through 24. It says in verse 20, but they did not listen to Moses. So, you know, the Lord ends up mentioning it in multiple places. He actually says it in the letter to the Hebrews in chapter three. He says, don't be like that wicked generation. And he's talking about this generation right here that put me to the test. See, it's one thing when God puts us to the test, but many times God views our actions as though we're putting him to the test. And in this particular passage, I put as a side note, they tested God and they ended up doing it their way. And it says they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it until the morning and it bred worms and it stank. And Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning, they gathered it, each as much as he could eat. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers each. And when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, this is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake, boil what you will boil, and all that is left over lay aside to be kept till the morning. So they laid it aside to the morning as Moses commanded them, and it did not stink, and there were no worms in it. You know, one of the things that I was seeing in here is that his instructions had purpose. Would they, because he was putting them to the test, would they trust his word daily and specifically? Or would they do it their way and move outside of God's will? 
First of all, they had to be willing to get up and to trust God each and every day, six days a week. They had to work. Then on the seventh day, they were not to work. Instead, they were to trust God. Now, on the, on the, on the sixth day, they had to actually gather up even more. They had to prepare all of that, and they had to trust God by faith that it wasn't going to go bad. But then when they put God to the test, they learned we're not going to be able to get away with this. I mean, don't you imagine that there were some people, I'm just not feeling like getting up and going to work this morning. I don't feel like... I'm going to get that bread that God's raining down from heaven this morning. I'm just going to go ahead and, or oh, I'm going to be tired tomorrow. It's going to be a late night. So what I'm going to do is I'm just leave some of that. And I'm just going to go ahead and eat it the next morning. And then when they woke up, it was stinky. It was decayed. It didn't have worms in there, right? But whenever they did it God's way, God said, no, I prepared it. I prepared it in such a way that if you'll trust me and do it my way, I'll take care of it on the sixth day. You got to work extra on the sixth day. And then the question is, too, were, were they gonna were they gonna refuse to not like rest on the seventh day and to trust God in what He was telling them to do? And uh, so uh, when I and, and what I wanted to say is this: is that I firmly believe that when Jesus said, "Give us this day our daily bread," He was talking about both physical and spiritual. I meant to ask somebody because I forgot at home to bring me a piece of bread and I forgot. Because I was going to pull it up at some point in time and say, a piece of bread is easy for God. It's, e it's easy for God to take care of our physical needs. I believe that. Now, I'm not saying it's easy to believe him for it. Right. <laughs> okay. But it is easy for God to supply right. our needs. Right. Amen. Right. Physically, yeah. if we will trust him and believe in him. But I can promise you, I do not believe that he's just talking about physical bread. So when we pray a, a, a pattern uh, 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 or an outline of the Lord's Prayer. We say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. I'm telling you right now, he's not just talking about a loaf of bread. He's not just talking about a piece of bread so that our bellies can be filled, so that physically we can be taken care of. But instead, the Lord's wanting you and I to learn how to grab a hold of the spiritual bread, the spiritual bread of heaven, and for us to understand that we're going to need it every day. We need God in our lives daily. God is not a part-time venture. God wants us to live for him full-time. God, the Lord gave everything whenever he gave his only begotten son. Amen. And Jesus gave everything when he gave his life for us. And he's asking you and I to do the same, to lay our lives down for him and for his kingdom. Now, there's at least two reasons that I can see that I believe that this is more than just physical. God, because number one, in Exodus, God promised to provide. But would his people be willing to trust him and not work extra on, on the Saturday? It was a test. He said it. It's a test. I'm, I'm doing it this way so that I can test them. And, and the test specifically had to do with obedience to his word. Amen? When he spoke and that, we, and that his people would obey him. Obedience to his word in both action and in timing. I think that that's important because many times God will speak to us about a specific situation Okay, and, and he'll and he'll minister to our hearts about something, but then if we're not careful, we'll run out. And I know we've heard this before, but we'll run out and we'll get ahead of God. And what we all and because nobody likes the wait room, nobody likes the process of patience. But I have to tell you that to to go outside of God's will when it comes to timing can be just as detrimental because it's outside of God's will. And so the Lord at times wants us. To be still and know that he is God and that we would wait on him, okay, in obedience in both action and in timing. If you do it your way, it decays and turns to worms. If you do it his way, amen, it will last. Jesus said this. this is, he said this in Matthew 4, 4. He answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. I, I can tell you, you got, we, we have to start to learn to think of the scriptures the way Paul would have thought of the scriptures, the way Jesus would have thought of the scriptures. And, and it's difficult for us to do that if we're not familiar with the scriptures. That's why it's important for us to read the scriptures. Again, for us to familiarize ourselves with the word of God. If we're going to live for God and we're going to live in the world that he's placed here, we're going to have to familiarize ourselves with what God is even saying. I promise you Jesus was familiar with the book of Exodus. 
I mean, Jesus quoted Exodus. He quoted, he quoted it to the devil. This is him quoting it to the devil right here. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That is so powerful. And the Lord's been really putting that on my heart lately. And I don't know if he's been putting it on your heart. I've been talking to people about it. And, and I don't know why it's such a profound thought, but I'm talking about every aspect of the word of God that you and I read and it's speaking to us. He's not okay with us ignoring this piece because it just doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal. There are, there are repercussions when we do not recognize and obey the word of the Lord and walk in what he has given us to do. Now, what I want you to understand is this. When I say that, I'm not talking about you obeying in your own strength. You need to understand that. I need to understand that. So let's go ahead and communicate that. What I'm talking about is this. No, what Jesus did, he came to earth. He offered, he lived a perfect life. He fulfilled the law of God. And then he offered his sinless, perfect life on the cross to pay the penalty that was owed to us. And in so doing, he purchased grace for us, which it flows from the person of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is God. And if you're born again, the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. And it's the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead that lives on the inside of you. And if you will yield to the will of God and trust in the power of God, he will give you the power that you need in order to obey the word of God. Amen. 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 The problem that we have... And you've heard me say it many times, and I'm just going to keep saying it because I know it's my problem, is this. We don't surrender Amen. when we see the written word of God. Because there's times where our flesh wants what it wants. Right? right? And, and that's the process of crucifixion of the flesh. And I'm pretty sure that some of that will probably come out in the little Bible study tonight in some way, shape, or form. So, but I want to talk to you a little bit about that powerful word. I, I put a little side note right here because look, the, I love the word of God. I love the word of God so much. I can't get enough of the word of God. I read it. I listen to it. I preach it. I go back and look at it. I watch videos of people preaching it. You know what I'm saying? I just love the word of God. I don't want to know so much. I just want to know the word of God. And so a lot of times the word of God really sticks in my mind. And I just love the various Types of literature in the Word of God. The Proverbs, the Psalms. I don't want to get into all that, but I'm just trying to make a point. The wisdom of the Proverbs, the wisdom of the Psalms, the wisdom of the various writings. And whenever you take those concepts and you intertwine them within the truth of Jesus and the truth of his finished work, it just becomes a real, it becomes a very powerful thing where your mind is becoming renewed according to the Word of God and you're becoming reenculturated. Right. From the old world that you used to live yes. in into a new yes. realm, a new sphere yes. where the yes. kingdom of God, Amen. where Jesus said, we talked about it last week, where the kingdom of God is within you. Amen. The kingdom of God, according to the person of the Holy Spirit, is on the inside of you. And that makes you different than the world around you. But if you don't start learning what the word of God says and you keep living according to the ways of the world and many people in the church do that, then now you're negating much of what God desires to do. But anyway, I wanted to share a couple of things. There's a couple of things popped in my head. Number one, healing. We can believe God for healing. His word says he's a healer and God wants us to believe that for provision, amen, for the new creation. You and I have to get to the place where we understand what the word of God says. That those that are in Christ Jesus, behold, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. The one that was born of Adam died in Christ, was buried in Christ, and the one that's been born again, hallelujah, has been resurrected into newness of life through the power of the Holy Spirit. You are a new creation with a new identity. Amen. Now, if you want to be your old man, the enemy will be more than happy, somebody said at the Bible study last night, last week, to tickle your heart, to tickle that spot, to wake it up a little bit. He'll be more than happy to oblige you. But if you want to be the new creation in Christ Jesus, you're going to have to start to understand what the Word of God says and learn how to yield to that and how to surrender to that. Amen? Amen. So, but one thing that really sticks out to me is this, uneven scales. It popped into my head, and it's a problem. 
the scales is how they used to do commerce and business. Does that make sense? Because back in the day, you just imagine they had dry goods, right? Like they have dry beans, right? And you pay by the pound, okay? And back then they had grains and things of that nature. And, and when it talks about uneven scales back in those days, see, scales also represent justice. Lady justice, right? That's why she's blindfolded and she's holding the scales. And so, see, God says it's, it's, a, it's a despicable thing in his eyes for there to be uneven scales. And so what would happen is, is that the person with the scales that was buying the goods and selling the goods had all the control. There it is right there. Thank you. A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. He's talking about scales right there. Okay? And what would happen is, is that if I'm buying from you... <clears throat> then I might, I might put more weight on this scale to make it look like you got less so I can give you less money for what you have. And you see, I can have my little weights over here that have a little bit more in it, but it says 10 pounds on it, or it says five pounds, but in reality it's 15. Does that make sense? And then whenever I'm selling to you, then I just take a little bit off or whatever, make it look like I'm giving you, I'm giving you more, but I'm really giving you less. And that's really what people that practice those kinds of illegal businesses do today. They'll put some other stuff in there to make it look heavier, but in reality, you're not getting what you're paying for, okay? Well, when we take that to the idea of justice, and the Lord wanted me to speak this because he focused in on this. When we get to the idea of God's justice, he hates it when you and I judge other people's behavior unequally. Now listen, this is a word for Christians today. This is a word for the preacher. The Lord despises it and say, and listen, the Lord even showed me something last week. and I don't remember what it was, but it had to do with me. It's like we sit here and we look at what other people have done wrong. Right. And we're not really being true and letting the Holy Spirit search our own heart. Yes. And we're focused on where they went wrong, but we're judging that situation with unequal scales and unequal balances. And the Lord's not OK with that. He, because, see, the scripture says that Jesus judges righteous judgment. That's why Jesus said God, the Father, has entrusted judgment to him because he judges righteous judgment. The Father can trust Jesus that when it comes down to it, he's going to judge righteously. He's going to judge based upon everything because he knows everything. But you and I? left to ourselves and sometimes even with the help of God in our lives are not judging righteously. We're judging better for ourselves. It's better for me if I do it this way. Come on, somebody. No, this, this will apply to your everyday life. I'm not going to sit here and spell it out in detail for you and plug in all the little blanks. This will apply to your everyday life, every minute of every moment of your life, whenever you're dealing with there's right and there's wrong. There's right and there's wrong. There's not a gray area. And if you got the Holy Spirit living in you, he's been speaking to you. The way you treat other people, the way you talk to other people, the way you handle your business, the way you punch the clock. Oh, Lord, help me. The, the, the speed limit. I don't really punch clocks too much anymore, but, but, but you get the point. Now, I know what time I'm supposed to be to work. Okay, you get the point. And then some people, other people sit back and like, yep, that's right. Preacher man, you should be at work all the time. You're right. Okay, but, but, but what is it that you're not doing? What is it that you're shaving off the top? What is it that you're not doing according to God's purpose and will? Unequal scales. Okay, the Lord, I'm just trying to make a point. Don't be obedient to all of God's word. And not for us to think more highly of ourselves than what we ought. And to let the Holy Spirit have his way Amen. in our hearts and in our lives. Amen? All right. As a side note... Sabbath is an important test of faith because Jesus fulfills the Sabbath through his work on the cross. Amen. I believe that. Jesus fulfills spiritually, at least on this side of glory, the Sabbath. Because, see, we can cease from, from the work of the law. The work of the law does not produce righteousness. Jesus was the righteousness of God. And what he came to do now fulfills the work of the law for righteousness. Jesus has given us as a gift his righteousness. We don't have to earn righteousness. Praise God. They could never really earn righteousness. But let's not get into that. That's too deep. But nevertheless, we don't have to live according to a system of rules and regulations. Yeah. It's, it's what Jesus has done that gives us the grace. And we can learn to rest in that. That's what it means to rest in Jesus. But there's there's an even bigger Sabbath coming. What you talking about? Can there be a bigger Sabbath than Jesus? There's a bigger Sabbath coming, my friend. When we enter into the next age, 
You want to talk about rest? It's going to be rest. It's going to be spiritual rest. It's going to be physical rest. It's going to be, and I'm not saying that there's no work still to do. That's not what I'm trying to say. But I'm talking about a whole nother level of operating in the glory of God. I'm talking about a whole nother level. And however you want to talk about the power of God taking over a vessel. And like now you've got a glorified body. So there's even more rest. To come is what I'm saying. But today I need you to understand that. According to the scriptures. According to the apostle Paul. And his writings about Jesus. According to even Jesus. Come unto me you that are weary and heavy laden. And I will give you rest. And you will take my yoke upon you. And, and because my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. And you will find rest for your weary soul. But first you got to know it. Then you got to believe it. Then you got to surrender to it. And you got to learn how to rest in it. Amen. And, and instead of just striving in the old way to do it. Right. So that was that was number one. Uh, the Lord was baking bread. And the question is, well, we're going to follow the recipe. He was providing bread. So I'm going to rain bread down from heaven. I just look. All you got to do is you just got to go gather it up. And I just want you to do it the way I'm asking you to do it. You, you pick it up every day. And on the sixth day, you pick up twice as much. And, and if you'll do that, you're going to have all the provision that you need. And the, and the spiritual concept was the fact that God wants you and I to obey him according to his word. Amen. And to trust him, to trust him. Amen. Not to take matters into our own hands, not to do it our own way, not to get ahead of him, not to get behind him, but to prayerfully, prayerfully to ask for this bread and say, God, please help me. To, to be in your will. Amen. Because listen, if we're not careful, we can all miss it. I don't care. The preacher, we can all miss God. And that's why we have to spend time in his presence and ask him to help us. Amen. Spend time in his word to know his will. All right. Number two, I don't like this kind. Can you give me the other one? And you know, sometimes it's like, I, listen, have y'all, y'all like bread? I, I'm, I shouldn't eat bread. Bread's a problem for me. But look, I've been living here a long time. I didn't know. If there was going to be anybody from home in here today, but I just need y'all to know that Kanadas is not a home of thing. Kanadas started in Morgan City. And all I'm trying to get at is this, is that back in the day when I first moved over here, every now and then I'd go to the Kanadas, the old Kanadas, and I'd be walking down the aisle and it's like, whoo, and I'd go feel and it was hot. And I'm like, oh, I wasn't even coming over here for no French bread, but that stuff just came out the oven. And look, and dude, I tear up a piece of French bread from Kanadas. But the, the point that I'm trying to make is this, is that, you know, in this next passage we're going to read, it's like people want bread or they want what God is offering. But then when they realize God's offering it differently than the way they wanted it, eh, I don't really want that one. I don't like that one. I want that other one. I don't want the one you serve well, that's a problem because God's not going to sit here and tailor make a recipe for you and I. I mean, he's got he's to tailor make a life for you. He's got different gifts for you and callings and things of that nature. But the gospel's the gospel. And we're either going to come his way or we're not. Amen. All right. So let's just take, take some time with some of these passages out of John chapter 6. And uh, I want you to, we're going to start with verse 25. And while she's putting it up there, I can kind of talk to you a little bit about it. It says, they found him on the other side of the sea. And they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? So, so a group of people show up on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And whenever they see Jesus, they call him Rabbi, which means teacher. And they say, hey, Rabbi, when, when did you get over here? And so you have to go back to the backstory for the first 25 or so, 20 something verses in John chapter 6 in order to get the backstory, but we're not going to do that. And I'm just going to kind of tell it to you. That was whenever the multitude was there, they were hungry, right? And the Lord said, No, we're going to feed them. And there was five barley loaves, right? Two fish. And the Lord multiplied the bread and multiplied the fish. Praise God. Everybody sat down. Everybody ate to the full. They picked up. I think that that was the same story because he did it twice. One was five loaves. One was seven loaves. And, and they picked up. I think this was the one where he picked up like 12 baskets of fragments. Okay. And, and so he, he did an absolute miracle. But then they wanted to make a king. If you go back and you read it, it's like, oh, he's the one. He's Messiah. He's the son of David. They're starting to like, ding, 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 this is it. Let's make him king. Why? Because we don't want to live under Roman occupation. We don't want to live under Roman rule. We don't like the way our lives are right now. We're oppressed. God said we were the head and not the tail. We were above and not beneath. Why are we living under this Roman dominion? We want freedom. He's the king. He's going to set us free. And when Jesus realized that they were going to try to make him king, he snuck out and he crossed over to the other side. 
And then they wake up in the morning and they're like, where's Jesus? Where's the miracle worker? And then they get the news, man, Jesus already, Jesus got out across the sea of Galilee. So there they go follow him. And so here's the story. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Look at Jesus. <laughs> Look at what he says. Y'all think y'all think y'all have done heard some rough preachers. Y'all ain't ready for this Jesus preaching stuff. I'm telling you right now. Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. That doesn't sound that bad when they write it like that, huh? But in reality, let me put it to you real time. Jesus is saying, you're not seeking me because you properly understood the miracles. You're seeking me because your bellies were filled. You got something that you were searching for. You got something that you liked. You really liked it. And now you're coming after me for a purpose that is not really what I am here really for you to be able to see right now. Uh, like, like I need you to be able to see past the fact that I filled your bellies is what he's trying to say. I needed you to be able to see what my purpose was really for here. It wasn't just all about you being blessed. And there was a bigger purpose here that I needed you to see. All right. And so what does this mean? You seek me not because you saw. Because, you know, like, I mean, I don't know about you, but whenever I read the scripture, like, I stop and I try to meditate on it. I try to ponder it. Sometimes I'll write stuff down. I think about it. I call up a friend, <laughs> you know, phone a friend. And I ask the Holy, Holy Spirit, please help me to understand these things, right? And, I, and so, you see, what does this mean? You seek me not because you saw, because you saw, because they, they but they did see. That's, that's what I'm saying. They were, they were there. They, they touched it. They ate it. They were filled physically, but they couldn't see spiritually. The word in the Greek is aido, E-I-D-O. Sometimes it's used to see something physically, but many times it's used as knowing something to the point that you can see it spiritually. So I want you to go ahead and put Romans chapter 5 verse 3 up there because I want to show you an example of this. All right. I felt like the Lord wanted me to focus in on this a little bit. Okay. You see that word knowing right there? What does it say? Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Now, I'm going to read to you the King James, because I know some of you love the King James. And we're gonna, we're gonna, I'm going to show you some stuff. If y'all got y'all's little phone apps with the olive tree, or you got your King James, y'all get that thing fired up and ready to go, because I want to show y'all something, okay, a little bit later. Wait, well, just in a second. But look what it, King James says this. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations, also knowing, knowing that tribulation works patience. And I have to be honest with you, the ESV version in the e in, in, in ESV where it says endurance, the word in, in, it says the word endurance is actually a better translation. Okay, than patience, because most of the time when we see, but, but they mean basically the same thing. It's a patience that gives you the strength that you need to endure. Have you ever been in a situation where you just wanted to quit and you just wanted to give up? Yeah. I mean, I've been in a lot of physical situations and even some spiritual situations where, you know, the next thing you know, like I'm feeling like I'm just ready to throw in the towel. Kind of like the old boxing match and the, the trainer throws in the white towel like he's done. You know, and, but, but that's to endure the trial. That's the idea. But I want you to see that this word knowing right there is the same word, Eido or Edo. And, 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 and he's talking, but, but what is he, how do you know this, Paul? That was the next thing I, I had to ask myself. How do you know that, Paul? I don't think I've even asked that question completely before. How do you know that right there, Paul? How are you going to rejoice in suffering? How, how are you going to rejoice in tribulation? How do you know? So much that you can see it spiritually that suffering produces endurance. How, how do you know so much that tribulation produces patience? How, how do you know that, Paul? You know what the Lord said? You don't remember him getting stoned? That was the Lord's answer to me. And so I went to Acts 14. We don't have to go there, but I'm going to tell you the story. And talk, the scripture talks about the fact that the apostle Paul was on a missionary journey and he was in Asia Minor. And then he went into this city called Lystra. And he was actually preaching in Lystra. And dude, it was such a good story. You need to go back and read it. It's in Acts chapter 14. It starts in verse 6. It starts in verse 8. 
And he's preaching in Lystra. And the word of God says, Paul fixed his eyes upon a man that was in the crowd. A man that was crippled that had never stood upon his feet. He was crippled from his mother's womb. And he said, he looked at him intently and knowing in his spirit that he had the faith to be healed. He told him, he said, rise up and walk on your feet. And that man walked up. He stood up. He started walking. And he started, he started leaping for joy. And then the whole city got into an uproar. And this is where I wanted you to see actually turn to it in Strong's if you got your app you don't have you, yeah you can go you can go to it Acts chapter 14 you're gonna have to scroll down till you find it Haley because I don't have the exact verse where the city people came and started calling Paul Mercury in the King James and calling Barnabas uh, Jupiter all right all right so uh, verse 12 there you go Verse 12. So you hold that. Now, actually, you put up the ESV version. I'm sorry. And they got their Strong's, uh, they got their Strong's version. Because I want to show you something about translations. Because <coughs> so, some of you so die hard. If, some, if the preacher says, the preacher says, oh, we're going to look at the ESV. Y'all still tripping on that. But I want to show you something. Okay. And that, but, but that's not my point right here. Let me stick to my point. My first point is this. Is that is that the city got into an uproar when they saw this healing, and the, and the next thing you know, they want to offer up sacrifice to Paul, who they were call, to Barnabas, who they were calling Jupiter, and to Paul and the King James, who they were calling Mercury, because he was the chief speaker. And Paul and Barnabas were like, "No, don't do it, don't don't do it." And finally, they 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 get them to understand not to offer the sacrifice. But then, if you keep reading the story, it says some Jews from Antioch came and convinced the crowd to stone them. And so the next thing you know, they stoned Paul. You remember that? And the Bible says that they they drug him outside the city and left him for dead. But the scripture says that as the saints gathered around him. He got up. <laughs> he got up, and then the Bible says he went from Lystra to Derby. And which was about probably about 10 clicks away, 10 miles maybe of a walking distance. And he goes over there and he starts preaching Jesus and he starts making disciples. And then he says, you know what? Before we get back to where we're really going, we need to go back to Lystra. Wait, what? Yeah, we need to go back to Lystra. We need to confirm the saints over there that received Christ as we were preaching the gospel. We need to make sure they're okay. We need to strengthen them and make sure that their heart is ready. And then he starts to preach to them and encourage them. And he says, with great tribulation, we will enter the kingdom of God. Yes. See, this life is just not an easy skate through. And especially to live for the Lord. And as the times are changing before our very eyes, this message is more important than ever before. You and I need to understand and prepare our hearts and get ready. That, that, that with great tribulation, if, if Jesus was persecuted, you can plan that the enemy will try to persecute you. The more you live for the Lord, the more you separate yourself. Come on, I'm not trying to make anybody feel weird, but I love this story. I'm not going to make anybody feel weird. Somebody told me recently that they were that a family member was in a youth ministry and that they were playing worship music to do uh, this little chair. You remember we used to do the musical chairs yes. to worship music. And the pastor, the pastor says, or I don't know if it was the youth pastor or what, he said, y'all not into this. I'm, I'm paraphrasing the story because I wasn't there. Y'all not into this too much. So let me switch the music and put on Taylor Swift. The person got up and got out. <laughs> the kid got up and got out and said, I'm not going to sit up in this. Praise God for that. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Because there's a difference between the world and the church. And if you want to feed your spirit Taylor Swift, then that's on you. And if you want to feed your spirit Jay-Z and all these other people. I don't have people leave the church before because I preached against uh, Kim, not Kim Kardashian. Who was, who was that? Singer, oh Lord, Cardi B. Cardi B. People didn't like the fact that I was coming against Cardi B. It's like, wait, what? Come on. And then, well, we're not even going to talk about the next song she came out with. But anyway, the point is this: is that with great tribulation, there's persecution, there's things that we're going to have to face. And and I'll guarantee you, it's a likelihood. I don't know if that person I probably didn't make a scene because this person seems sweet. But had you made a scene when you walked out of there, like? Ichabod, the spirit of the Lord has left this place. I promise you, you go back, they're probably not going to like you too much. 
If you made enough of a scene when you got up and you got, I'm not saying you should make a scene. That's not what I'm saying. However, the Lord told you to do it, you do it. But what I'm trying to get at is, is that if you make people enough aware that the Lord's not pleased Amen. with that, then you're going to tell me that the Lord's pleased with Taylor Swift in the youth ministry? No. Thank you. Because he's not. Because Taylor Swift is bad. <laughs> and, and if we're going to sit there and feed our spirit that anyway, I didn't mean to preach on Taylor Swift. But what I wanted you to see is this, is that the word knowing right there. I know. Now, I want to go back to if you've already found it out in your Strong's dictionary. The point that I want to say is, is this, is that it says in the ESV, they called Barnabas Zeus and they called Paul Hermes. In the King James, it said they called Bar uh, Barnabas Jupiter and they called Paul Mercury. So if you read that, you know somebody's not telling the something's not right, or it seems like it's not right. If you click on your Strong's, it's actually Zeus and Hermes. So the ESV got the literal translation more so than the King James. But then I went and did some more research, and the planet Jupiter was associated with Zeus. Zeus. <laughs> Zeus. And, the, and the planet Mercury was associated with Hermes. So that's why the King James translators put it that way. So it's not completely wrong, but it's not as accurate as the ESV in this particular thing. And I just wanted to use that because we're an informal church and we believe in Bible study and we want to understand what it is that we're learning. Amen. All right. So he said, you do not seek me because you saw you could not properly perceive the miracle that was taking place in front of you. See, Jesus is coming to reveal himself to this lost and dying world and people still even today are most more focused about what they're going to get out of the deal than to see what God is really offering and what he's really Amen. doing. Amen. All right. Now let's go back to the John passage where he said, you do not seek me. And then we're going to go to John chapter six, verse 27. And, and Jesus says, do not work for food that perishes. Now, does that not remind you of the Exodus passage where it turned into worms and it decayed and it started to stink? But anyway, it, and food does perish, right? Just like certain metals rust. And remember that? He said, don't lay up, don't store for yourself treasures that <coughs> where moth and rust can corrupt. And, that, and he was talking about material possessions. This is another way for him to teach against us trying to live for this temporary world. Amen. Don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. And then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Praise God. Yes. That you believe in him. Look at that. So they're still thinking about works. So oftentimes, even still today, what do we have to do in order to please God? And Jesus is letting us know in order to, put, to do the works of God, it all has to start with believing in him whom God sent. And when you properly believe in him and trust in him and the work of God begins to manifest in your life, and you yield to him, the Holy Spirit will begin to birth something new on the inside of you to where you want to work for him, to where you want to separate your life out for him. And now works are flowing through grace instead of you trying to work to attain righteousness. That's the dip because that's a false doctrine. And it's an important that you know that and, because, listen, I grew up in a works based type environment for sanctification, for holy living, for righteous living. I was told, okay, you got your, you got saved now. All right. But now you've got these things that you need to do. Read more, go to church more, get involved more. All of these things that are very important for the Christian, but it, you can't flip flop it. You don't work for righteousness. Jesus's work gave you a gift of righteousness. When you learn that and yield to that, now the Holy Spirit starts to do an amazing work on the inside of your heart. And you, you'd be so hungry to work that, that people won't be able to stop you. But now as you work, let me let, let, me let you in on another little scene. As you work, prepare your heart. Prepare your heart for offenses will come. As you lay your life down for Jesus, and unfortunately, people in the church will hurt your heart. Yes. You know that? Have you learned that yet? Yep. That people in the church will hurt your heart. 
Because if you don't know it yet, I need you to understand that. And it doesn't even mean that they did. Most of the time they didn't do it on purpose. Most of the time when people hurt you, they did not do that. Most people that come to church on the regular basis love God. Right? They wouldn't come to church if they didn't love God. But I have to tell you, if you're going to sit outside of a church and you're going to sit there and you're going to say, I don't go to church because the people hurt me, that's not going to fly. That's not going to fly in the, in the will of God. You, you may need to search and prayerfully seek for a church that you feel like God is leading you to, but it's not going to work. You sitting on the couch because the word of God is clear. It says, forsake not the gathering of the brethren. And you need to find a church where Jesus is being presented in such a way that the real Jesus is showing up. Amen. And you hope and pray for the people that go to that church that they're allowing the Holy Spirit to form and fashion Jesus on the inside of them so that they will be become more cognizant, more aware, more sensitive that their behavior, their language, the things they say, the way they act, the things they do would not be an offense, but instead would increase the kingdom of God and encourage the people of God. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Amen. So, so, that, so then Jesus says uh, in verse 32, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God, verse 33, is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So in the Exodus story, Jesus is making sure that they know that the bread that you received in, in the Old Testament, Moses didn't give you that bread. My father in heaven gave you the true bread. The true bread is, is me. I'm the bread of life. And this is the whole purpose of all of those things in the past was to prepare humanity that I was going to show up and that this is the answer that the father had. He says, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. That is so powerful. That is so beautiful. If you're born again today, if you're not born again in this place, you don't even understand what I'm talking about. Let, let me say that a little bit louder. If you're not born again in this place, you don't have a clue of what I'm talking about right now. You on video, and I'm not saying that rude. I'm just a loud dude. Okay, if you are not born again, you do not have a clue of what I'm talking about. Because, see, that means the life of God has not moved into the inside of you yet. When the life of God moves into the inside of you and you feel the guilt and the burden lifted off of your heart and you know it's a work of the Holy Spirit because you couldn't do it. Now you begin to understand what that life is and you begin to appreciate the Father so much because he loved you. So it might take you a little while to get here too. What, what I'm saying is what I'm trying to talk about because you got to learn the things of God. Right. And these things have to work together. But I'm just telling you, I have been I'm so thankful that I'm thankful right now. I'm so thankful that I'm thankful right now because I'm really, I didn't deserve, you didn't deserve what God did for you. And but God the Father loved us so much that he sent his son. And do you realize how privileged we are to have been called by God? To, to have heard the voice of God and to have been able to have the grace to respond to God. Sometimes we sit here and we think, we're thinking so highly of ourselves. Like, yeah, man, I'm the darling of heaven. No, you're not. Jesus is. Amen. And then God was merciful Amen. to you. Amen. Praise God. And, and, and you, we need to be thankful for salvation and for the continuous moving of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and in our lives. And then the call of God. I know I said this last week. I, I don't mean to keep doing, but so many, but it, it intertwines with what I was saying earlier. That sometimes we get hurt in church. We feel like we're we feel like we're not appreciated. I don't know if you've ever felt that way. Sure, you have. We've all felt that way. Or they don't appreciate me. He don't appreciate me. She don't appreciate me. It's <coughs> real stuff. It's real life. Right, right. Mama don't appreciate me. She don't. You know, daddy don't. Nobody appreciates. Me. Okay. And, and we get in this, but look, we got to get, Lord, help us. Yes. Help us. You know, help us to get to yes. where we really, look, no, Lord, you appreciate me. Yes. I appreciate you, Lord. Even if you never did another thing for me. Jesus. I appreciate Jesus. you, Lord. Jesus. Boy, you're so good. You saved me. I was a wretch. I was so lost. You saved me. When I look back at that 17-year-old boy, I'm like, what? What? You saved me. I owe you everything. 
the breath that's in my lungs belongs to you, God. And, and, you know, and, 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 and praise God. And we're privileged. A thankful heart goes a long, long way, Amen. child of God. Thankful. Amen. Praise God. Amen. So, so he says, I'm this bread. And then they say, sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, but it's about to change because they ain't really liking this. This ain't baked bread from Canada's, my friend. Let me tell you. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you in verse 36, you have seen me and yet you do not believe. You saw, you saw, you were there, but you didn't see it. You've seen me, but yet you don't believe. Okay. And then he goes into verse, let's go to verse 50. Jesus, this is when he shifts gears on his message. He said, this is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. He's talking about eternal life, right? I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. He, 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 he clarified what this bread is. The bread of life is his flesh. Now, what does that even mean? Because we know that the Catholic Church, and I mean, let's just go ahead and call it what it is, because maybe somebody on video or maybe somebody in here, you needed to hear that. The Catholic Church believes in something called transubstantiation, yeah. and they believe that they do a, 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 a ceremony and that that the wafer literally, no, literally, yes. through some type of a, what you call, I'm going to call it magic, through some type of magic, turns into the literal flesh of Jesus. That, that's what they teach. If you don't believe it, then yes. you need to go back and research it. Yes. And that the juice, that the wine turns into literal blood. Okay, that's what they teach. All right, and, and, but that's not what Jesus is teaching. And so we're going to make that clear here in a moment. We're going to show you his, what, what the Lord said. He said, the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. But he literally meant the bread of the life of the world is my flesh. But what he's talking about is, I'm about to give this flesh. See, because the children, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Because the children were partakers of flesh and blood, he became the same. He became us. So that he can take away the power of him who had power over death, which was Satan. See, Jesus became flesh because the first man, Adam, was created and made living a living soul that inhabited a fleshly body. But then Adam became a sinner. And now the whole world, while he was created in the image and likeness of God, he became a sinner. So now God became flesh as the last Adam to make right what the first Adam made wrong. And whenever he died on the cross, he gave his flesh, his sinless flesh. See, your flesh is sinful. My flesh is sinful because we were born of Adam, right? And we've also sinned. But, but Jesus was not born of Adam. Jesus was of incorruptible seed, born of the virgin, and that his flesh had no sin. And so therefore, he was the wage payment for sin. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So Jesus took his sinless flesh and offered it on the cross in your place and in my place. Amen. And that brings life to a lost and dying world. At least the opportunity for life. Because now you must go receive it. See, you must go out every day. Praise God. I'm going back to Exodus for a second. You must believe God. And you must go out there and take it unto yourself. Receive what God has provided. Whatever God has provided, you receive it to yourself. Amen. Praise God. And so he says, he says, and the bread that I will give is to the world of my flesh. And, and, and then uh, it says, the Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Right. Then you remember in the Exodus passage, you're like, well, I know God said for us to collect double on Saturday. Uh, but, you know, with today's Tuesday, I'm going to just go ahead and see what happens if I leave it in the tent overnight and see what happens, right? So they're already kind of disagreeing with God in Exodus. And then here, over here, it says that how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So there's already a different opinion taking place, right? There's a disputation. We don't agree with this. Okay. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, like, you know what I love about Jesus? He don't calm down. 
Jesus does not calm down. He doesn't downshift. He hits turbo and he throws it in the fifth gear. Like he ain't playing with people. I'm telling you. When he sees that they got a problem with it, he doesn't calm it down. He hits it even harder. He said, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Yes. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Boy, I tell you, boy, I, I love Jesus' preaching because he is not really even a little bit worried about who's about to get offended. You know why? Because he's telling them the truth. He's telling them the truth, and he knows that if they reject this truth, they're not going to have access to eternal life. Once he saw they grumbled, he hit it even harder, right? And then, and then he turns later to his disciples. Y'all remember that? And he says, you going to go too? You going to leave too? And Peter says, where would I go, Lord? You alone have the words of eternal life. It's only you. Now, I couldn't help myself because this has been on my mind lately, but their response wasn't, you have the best vocals, Lord. Their response wasn't, you can really strum that harp, Lord. You got, man, you make that harp sing, right? It wasn't, you have the best ideas about children's programs. It wasn't, you, know, you have the best miracles. No, listen to me. It wasn't, you have the best miracles, Lord. As a matter of fact, the people that saw the miracles left. When he got down to the nitty gritty and he told them the truth, the people that were looking for miracles got up and got out. Oh my God. That's why Jesus said a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. Praise God for signs and wonders that follow the preaching of the truth of the gospel. Praise God for signs and wonders. Praise God for the gifts of the Spirit. Praise God for healing. Lord, we want to see your hand move. We want to see your spirit move. But we cannot, we will not try to sacrifice the preaching of the gospel, the preaching of the word of truth. Hallelujah. Eternal life to try to see some kind of movement like that. No, Lord. No. But I have a question. How does a person know that they are being fed words of truth if they've never eaten words of truth? That, that's a good question. You've got to admit it. Because if you talk to enough people outside the walls of a church, you'll start to realize, man, I walked into two different rooms yesterday. One Christian in this room that went to one particular church in town. Another Christian in the next room that went to a particular church in town. I engaged them both in conversation. And I'm telling you right now, it's not important what church is, but I'm here to tell you that the first one I talked to was definitely more kingdom minded than the next one. And I could tell they both love God. But what I'm trying to say is this, is that a lot of times people think that they're getting truth just because somebody quoted a scripture. Right. Yeah. Do y'all understand that? Are our brains to the point now where we understand that just because a preacher quotes a scripture doesn't mean that he's actually preaching the truth. That's right. Okay. Amen. And, and just because he thinks he's preaching the truth. No, but the truth is in there. And that's why we're supposed to be like Bereans and we're supposed to dig it out. And we're supposed search, to find yes. the truth. Search it out. Amen. Amen. He certainly seems to be making a connection between food and life, but it's obvious that he's talking about spiritual life, not physical life. So I have another question. How do we allow his flesh to be our spiritual food? And I'm going to let you think about it for a second, but this is the answer. How do we allow his flesh to be our spiritual food? And the answer that keeps showing up, the answer is the connection between the spirits moving through the word of his cross. It comes from the spirit of the word. When he says it is my flesh, he's talking about his sacrifice. When we use the word cross, we're not talking about two pieces of wood. We're talking about his death, his sinless death that was offered as payment for our sinful lives. You understand that? That's what brings life to a sin riddled world is his flesh that was without sin. So then he says in John 6, 33, this is important. He said, he because he clarifies it for us. He says it, right? Here. <clears throat> it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. So it's not transubstantiation that he's talking about. And, and if you, I'm not going to leave that alone right now. But look, it is the spirit that gives life. The flesh itself is no help at all. No, his sinless flesh is all the help you will ever need. Yeah. 
But he's trying to tell you, you can't cut a chunk of skin off my arm and eat it and think that's not what I'm talking about. It's the words that I have spoken to you. Well, whoa, Jesus. No, I mean, I'm sure his disciples took him to later and said, Jesus, why did you talk about it like that? Why did you do that terrible thing you do again? Why did you talk in veiled language? Why didn't you just come out? And he does. He talks to them. He's going to say, I'm going to, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be turned into the hands of sinners. And, and I'm going to raise again. I'm going to rise again. So he did. He spoke very plainly. But you know one of the reasons that I've learned that Jesus speaks in veiled language? Because not everybody's really honest in their heart of what they're looking to get from Jesus. And he already knows that because they're showing up for miracles. Yes. And in reality, what he wants people to do is they, he wants them to want the truth. He wants their motives to be right. And whenever our motives are right and we start to seek God for what he's really trying to show us, he will show up and he will meet your need. I promise you that. If you will get your heart right and you will, you will lower yourself in his presence and you will say, Father, I need to know the truth. Please reveal that truth to me. Somebody was praying up here earlier. Said, you know, I, and you listen. You keep seeking God. You keep looking for the truth. You keep digging. You keep praying. You keep asking. He will show up and he will make that true. Amen. Amen. I want to, and I mean, I want to just say about the words that I've spoken to you. John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. He is the word. John 1, 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Revelation 19, 13, he's clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the word of God. So when we begin to just like food is physical and you can see it, touch it, eat it, and it becomes nutritional life to the physical body. Jesus became flesh. And when he, through his word and faith in his word, becomes our spiritual diet, we gain spiritual life. The truth of God's word, empowered by the Holy Spirit, becomes spiritual life. It becomes spiritual nutrition. Anybody that has gained a revelation of what Paul was talking about, about being a new creation in Christ, and has felt the burden and the, and the power of sin leave their body. Listen, I'm not asking asking you if you never messed up since you knew that because we all in this room know that each and every one of us have what I'm trying to talk about is if you have ever gained revelation knowledge from the Holy Spirit where he began to show you that you legit were a new creation in Christ Jesus and the things that you used to struggle with before you before you knew that and how they fell off of your life after you knew that, y'all know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about freedom and liberty, and you ain't had really nothing to do with it. You, other than putting your eyes on the Word of God, and then the Holy Spirit quickens that truth to your spirit, man. And look, boom, that stuff starts falling off. That thing that you was trying to go to the meetings over, you was going to this over, you was trying to get people to lay their hands on you, you was trying to get all this stuff to happen. And I'm not saying that any of that's wrong at the right time and whatever the case. I'm trying to make a point though. When the, when the Holy Ghost reveals the truth of God's Word, it's the words that I speak to you there, spirit of their life. When that comes awakened on the inside of your spirit, man, now you know, oh Lord, I see see it now. I see it. There's victory in you. There's freedom in you. You've already purchased it for me. That goes back to that vision. I got another one I want to share with you, but where they were all in the prison. You remember I was talking about that. They were all in the prison and they were kind of like just walking around like they were, like they were lost. And then all of a sudden one old boy just walked over there and the door to the prison gate was unlocked and it just walked out. And then everybody's like, what's he doing? Can't do that. And then, and then he, and then everybody started walking out and they were out in this, this big open field and they just all started worshiping the Lord because see, victory has already been purchased. You're already free. You don't, you just, you don't understand what I'm trying to tell you. You are already free. You know, you're already a new creation in Christ Jesus. You are already free. Hallelujah. You, but you have to start to learn that. You, you have to start to, your mind has to be renewed to this truth. And then once your mind's renewed to it, you just need to make up your heart that you're going to surrender to it. By the grace of God, we're going to surrender to it. Amen? Praise God. Yeah, in the Exodus passage, they didn't want to do it God's way. In the John passage, they didn't want the bread that he was offering. Now, I want to tell you another little vision that the Lord gave me a few days ago. I was in the back of the church, and, and I feel like it does kind of go with this. I'm not saying it was for me to specifically for this. And I don't think that this was specifically our church. I'm not saying that it doesn't affect our church, but I think that this is the church as a whole of what 
the, 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 the way that the church is and the way the times are, right? And so in this vision, it was another one. It was like a rolling hill pasture land. Now, one of the things that I learned through the scriptures, it was like a big old wide open rolling hill pasture land. The psalmist said, you have put me in an open space. That's exactly what the Lord was showing me that this was. It was an open space. When the psalmist would say that, he was talking about a place of safety because he was always on the run. And sometimes he was caught in caves and he was. And so whenever the Lord, when he felt freedom, he felt safety because he could see his surroundings. This is what the vision was. It was like this rolling hills, green grass, and there was a group of people. I mean, it seemed like in the vision about as big as what this is right here, this area right here. And the way that they were walking is that they were all, they were all going in different directions, but they weren't going off into the horizon necessarily, but they, they just had different opinions and they weren't in, in unity necessarily with one another. And it was almost like they were walking around in circles and, 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 and the, the Lord put in my, and I knew that it was modern day stuff because they were all wearing t-shirts and blue jeans. And, and, and they were just walking and they, and they were circling around each other. Nobody had really had a plan. And then the Lord spoke to me and said, they're like sheep that are scattered without a shepherd. He put that scripture on me. And then he also said they need the shepherd of their souls. And I went back to Matthew 9, 36 through 38. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. And in the Peter passage, he says, you were like sheep going astray, but you turn back now to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So what the Lord was showing me is that in the Exodus passage, they didn't really want to agree with God on what he was having to say. In the John passage, some people started to grumble and they kind of just went off and they went their own way. And then I realized that in this, what God showed me, that there was a similarity. So I figured I'd go ahead and share it with you. But that the Lord wants his people. I'm talking about his people. This is a big deal. We really need to be praying that God's people would be awakened and that God's people would be empowered, amen, to, to receive the strength of God. Because people are divided and they're separated by their opinions. Put us back together, Lord, amen. And so, listen, after that, this is, i got to share this with you because it, this is only the second time this has happened to me. One other time when I went to prayer room, a lot of times, and I call it, I call it kind of like a, I don't know if you like this word, but I call it kind of like a prophetic prayer. It, it's a spirit filled prayer, but the way that the scriptures come, you know how you ever prayed and the scriptures start flowing and you start speaking scriptures. And the reason I'm calling it prophetic and not just spirit filled is because a lot of times when it's happened to me, when I know it was, and when I feel like it was prophetic, it was because it was more like the scriptures were coming forth and it was becoming like a declaration. It was yes. becoming more like an intercessory type powerful prayer. Like I was praying God's will and, and was praying and asking and for God to move. Well, this was different because because it, did, it just came out of my mouth. So this was more of a prophetic utterance. And I believe that it had something and it came right after this particular vision. And what it, and this is what this is all that happened. I was praying and the next thing he said, "Oh Lord, put flesh on these bones. Give them a Lord, no it says, yes, this is how it started. Yes, Lord, these bones can live. Put sinew on these bones. Put them back together, Lord. Oh Lord, put flesh on these bones. Give them a mouth, Lord. Let your word go forth. Let your word be declared in the earth. Amen. And so that was what came out of me. And whenever I see all of these things that are going on, and I see Jesus saying that I am the bread of life, and if people will feed on me, and if they will receive the nutrition and the condition of the church, and this ha thing having to do with the shepherd. Somebody asked me one time, are you a shepherd? And, and you know what, what I would say about that is this. I'm, a, I'm an under shepherd. <laughs> I work for the shepherd. Amen. 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 And, and I know this, that God has shown me on more than one occasion that part of his will for my life is to try to teach people how to access Jesus. That's it. How to access Jesus. Yes. Because no matter where you are, no matter what you're going through, if you know how to access Jesus, if there's no more cellular service, yes. if there's no more being able to get to the church house, 
If there's no more being able to drive on the roads. I'm not saying any of that's going to happen. But if it ever happens, you need to be able to know how to get a hold of Jesus. Right. Amen. Right. Jesus needs to be the shepherd of your soul. We don't want to be scattered around. Amen. Not knowing what we're doing. All right. Praise God. Hallelujah.